This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be about Dirichlet's theorem. So um, Dirichlet's theorem says that um, if A and B are co-prime positive integers, then there are infinitely many primes of the form A n plus B for n um, greater than or equal to 1. For example, if we take um, a equals 10, b equals 1, this means there are infinitely many primes with last digit 1. And so you can see there's sort of 11, 31, 41, and so on. Um, so we've proved this in various special cases before. Um, so in the case b um, equals 1 and a equals p a prime, we showed there were infinitely many numbers of the form um, np plus 1 by um, considering the polynomial x to the p minus, minus 1 over x minus 1, which is x to the p minus 1 plus x to the p minus 2 and so on, plus 1. Um, there's a variation of this where you can show there are infinitely many primes of the form 1 modulo a, even when a is not prime, by using something called a cyclotomic polynomial, um, which is a polynomial whose roots are primitive nth, eighth roots of unity. So, so this is the cyclotomic polynomial for a prime p. Um, we also did various other cases that were quite easy. For instance, 4n, 4a plus 3, so 4n plus 3 and 3n plus 2, followed by an easy variation of Euclid's proof that there are infinitely many primes. And I, I guess, of course, the, the case a equals 1 is, is, is also easy by Euclid's proof. Um, we gave some other proofs um, for um, regressions like 4n plus 1 or 3n plus 1 by um, using other polynomials. For 4n plus 1, we consider the polynomial x squared plus 1, for example. And for 8n plus 3 and 8n plus 7, we um, gave a proof using properties of the quadratic residue symbols um, 2p and minus 2p. And we used polynomials x squared plus or minus 2. Um, so there are quite a few cases when we can give sort of reasonably easy proofs of Dirichlet's theorem. The problem is none of these methods seem to generalize to the general case. Um, for example, um, these methods mostly seem to work if all elements of the group Z modulo NZ star have order 2. And this only works if N is a divisor of 24. So we get 1, 2, 3, um, 4, 6, 8, and for that matter, 12 and 24. So, so for these numbers, we expect to find a, a reasonably easy proof. But in general, this just doesn't work. Um, so what Dirichlet did was he used Euler's proof that there are infinitely many primes. So, so we just quickly recall that if you write zeta of s, which is 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s and so on, and Euler showed this could be written as an infinite product, product over 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s, where this is a product over all primes. And Euler simply noted that zeta of s um, is infinite at s equals 1. And um, um, at s equals 1, this product becomes the product over all primes of 1 over 1 minus p to the minus 1, which is finite unless there are <coughs> Uh, unless there are an infinite number of primes. Um, and in an earlier lecture, we showed there was a variation of this. You could show there are infinitely many primes that are 1 or 3 mod 4 by using the series L of S, which is 1 over 1 to the S, minus 1 over 3 to the S, plus 1 over 5 to the S, and so on. And this also is an Euler product. It's the product over P of 1 minus... 1 over 1 minus chi of p times p to the minus s, where chi of p is equal to plus 1 if p is congruent to 1 mod 4, and minus 1 if p is congruent to 3 modulo 4. And now the idea is that um, this series is um, non-zero and finite at um, s equals 1. I mean, it's just an alternating series, and you can see 
that it's non-zero because the sum of these two terms is positive and the sum of the next two terms is positive and so on. So that means this product is actually finite. And what this product is, it's a product over p congruent to 1 mod 4 of 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s and a product over p congruent to 3 mod 4 of 1 over 1 plus p to the minus s. And um, um, the fact that this is finite sort of means that there are roughly the same number of primes that are 1 mod 4 and 3 mod 4, because if there were too many primes that were 1 mod 4, um, this, this half would dominate and it would be, and, uh, and the product would be infinite, and if there were too many primes that were 3 mod 4, this product would dominate and the result would be, be, be 0. So um, the, the fact that this is finite and non-zero at s equals 1 sort of means that in some vague sense the primes that are 1 mod 4 and 3 mod 4 kind of balance out. Uh, of course we need to make this balancing out idea a bit more precise. I'm, I'm just giving a rough idea. Um, and since we know that there are infinitely many primes altogether this means there must be an infinite number that are 1 mod 4 and an infinite number that are 3 mod 4. Um, and Dirichlet's proof um, basically consists of taking this idea for primes modulo 4 and generalizing um, it to arbitrary um, congruences. Um, so let, let's just summarize, um, let's just give an overview of Dirichlet's proof. We can say that, that there, are, there are essentially three steps. The first step is we need to define analogues of chi of um, n. Th th this was the one that was plus 1 for 1 mod 4 and minus 1 for 3 mod 4. And we need to define the analog of Ls. So, so, so we, we know that for modulo 4 and we need to define them for other things. The next thing you notice is that a key step in the proof was to show this function was non-zero at s equals 1. And from that we were able to deduce the um, the, the, the Dirichlet theorem. So, so the second step is to show that um, so, so L chi of um, um, 1 is non-zero. Um, so L chi is going to be the generalization of L of S. We're going to um, generalize chi to other so-called Dirichlet characters and define an L series for them. And a key step is to show that these functions don't vanish at 1. And um, the third step is to show that um, L chi of 1 being non-zero implies Dirichlet's theorem. Um, and in some sense, Part three is reasonably straightforward. Once you've had this idea of examining these um, so-called Dirichlet's theorem L of chi, it's not too difficult to deduce Dirichlet's theorem from the non-vanishing. Uh, the, the really tricky part of the proof is, is to show that these functions are all non-vanishing at, at the point one. So, so this is rather strange. It's sort of deducing this number theoretical fact about prime numbers from this real analytic fact that certain infinite series um, converge to a non-zero number. Um, you remember that when we were discussing the prime number theorem, we showed that the prime number theorem depended on the fact that zeta of s is um, non-zero whenever the real part of s is equal to 1. So um, in both cases we see that the behaviour of prime numbers is controlled by whether certain Dirichlet series vanish. So for the prime number theorem we want the Riemann zeta function to be non-zero on a certain line and for Dirichlet's theorem we want these L series to be non-zero at s equals 1. And this is very much a theme in, in analytic number theory. The primes seem to be kind of controlled by zeros of certain Dirichlet series. Um, anyway, um, so um, let's define what Dirichlet characters are. So, so first of all, we look at this character chi, which, which took values 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, and so on. And we're trying to think what properties of this um, um, did we 
do, do we need? The, 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 the first one is that chi, this chi is periodic mod 4. So we, we now want to define a Dirichlet character um, modulo n. So the, the first property we're going to say is that chi of um, m plus big N is equal to chi of m. So, so it is period n for some, for some number n. Um, secondly, we notice that it vanishes, that, that this chi vanishes whenever, when, whenever its argument is even. And the generalization of that is going to be that chi of m is equal to naught whenever m and n are co-prime. And the third property is um, that this is actually multiplicative. So chi of m n is equal to chi of m chi of n. So this was used in um, writing down the Euler product for the corresponding Dirichlet series. And um, these are more or less um, the definition of um, a Dirichlet character. We should also add an extra condition to stop it being completely trivial. I mean, it could just be zero everywhere, which is not terribly interesting. So you normally add a condition saying that chi of one is equal to one, just to eliminate stupid cases. Um, well, there's an alternative way of thinking about this. Chi is a homomorphism of groups from um, Z modulo NZ star to the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. Um, and a homomorphism is just condition three here. It says it preserves multiplication and conditions one and two well condition one says that it's um, defined on z modulo nz and condition two says you can ignore its values on the elements of z modulo nz that are not co-prime to n so so um, a sort of modern definition of a Dirichlet character would just be this one here. Dirichlet's original definition was, was like this because the concept of group hadn't actually been defined at the time, so he needed to do everything by, by, by hand, so to speak. Um, the corresponding Dirichlet series is L chi of S, or sometimes written L S of chi, or L chi of S, or whatever, and it's just um, chi of 1 over 1 to the s plus chi of 2 over 2 to the s plus chi of 3 over 3 to the s and so on. So um, we'll be using this Dirichlet series quite a lot. So what we should do now is just go through some examples um, in order to see what these things look like. So let's start with n equals 1 then the only Dirichlet character is chi of n equals 1 for all n, because it, it, chi of 1 equals 1, and it is period 1. So the Dirichlet, so, so, so the L series we get, um, L chi of s, is just 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s and so on, which is just the usual Riemann zeta function. So that wasn't terribly interesting. And of course it has the usual Euler product, product over p of 1, 1 minus p to the minus s. So now let's try n equals 2. Um, so um, in this case, z modulo 2z star just as one element. So there's only one possible that, um, chi, which goes 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on. So um, chi is 1 for n odd and 0 for n even. So we get the series 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 5 to the s and so on. Um, but this isn't really a new function because what we notice is that it's equal to a product over p odd of 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s. So in other words it's just equal to um, 1 minus 2 to the minus s times zeta of s. So it's not really a new function. It just differs from the Riemann zeta function by this, by this rather elementary and uninteresting factor. Um, so um, um, next we try n equals 3. And here z modulo 3z star has two elements, 
1 and 2. And now there are two possible values, values of chi. Um, first of all, it could just be 1 everywhere, but it could also be minus 1 on the character 2. So we get two L series. 1 is 1 over 1 to the S plus 1 over 2 to the S plus 1 over 4 to the S plus 1 over 5 to the S and so on. And the other one is 1 over 1 to the S minus 1 over 2 to the S plus 1 over 4 to the S minus 1 over 5 to the S and so on. And this one um, again turns out to be more or less the same as the Riemann zeta function. It's just 1 minus 3 to the minus S times zeta S. So it's not terribly um, it's, it's not terribly interesting. Um, this one, on the other hand, is sort of a new L series. Um, um, now let's take a look at n equals 4. So we get z over 4z star, and this again has two elements, which are 1 and 3 mod 4. So um, there are two possible Dirichlet characters. The Dirichlet character can be 1 everywhere, or it can be minus 1 on, on 3. Um, and if it's 1 everywhere, we get um, 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 5 to the s, and so on. And you may notice this is exactly the same as a character we had for n equals 2, which was in turn more or less the Riemann zeta function. So this isn't new, it's just 1 minus 2 to the minus s times zeta s. And for this one, we get the um, L series we mentioned at the beginning, um, which is 1 over 1 to the S minus 1 over 3 to the S plus 1 over 5 to the S and so on. And we should notice that this converges for S equals 1 and is non-zero because, um, as we said, we can see it's non-zero because these two terms have a positive sum, the next two terms have a positive sum and so on. And while we're about it, we can notice that this series is non-zero because these two have a positive sum, these two have a positive sum, the next two have a positive sum, and so on. So this is non-zero at s equals 1. Um, so what about n equals 5? Um, well, this starts to get a little bit more complicated. So um, there are 1, 2... We, we, the, the, there are four possible um, elements of z modulo 5z star. And how do we find characters? Well, what we notice is that um, um, we can write these as 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, and 2 to the 3. And we notice that 2 to the 4 is equal to 1. So, so chi of 2 to the power of 4 must actually be equal to 1. So chi of 2 must be 1i minus 1 or minus i because these are the only complex numbers whose fourth power is 1. And once we've figured out what chi of 2 is, everything else is determined. So we get four possible characters. The first one is 1 everywhere except at 5. The next one goes 1i minus 1, minus i. The next one goes 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. And the next one goes 1, minus i, i, minus 1. Now you notice for the first time we're actually getting some non-real complex values of these characters. Um, and let's look at the L series. Well, well, this one, as usual, is 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 4 to the s. And then we miss out 1 over 5 to the s we get plus 1 over 6 to the s. And as before, this is just 1 minus 5 to the minus s times zeta of s. So it's not really new. Um, these ones, however, are, 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 are all new characters. So let's look at this one first. It's a little bit easier. We get 1 over 1 to the s, minus 1 over 2 to the s, minus 1 over 3 to the s, plus 1 over 4 to the s. And then we get minus 1 over 6 to the s, so plus 1 over 6 to the s, minus 1 over 7 to the s, minus 1 over 8 to the s, plus 1 over 9 to the s, and so on. And now let's see that this does actually converge to something that's non-zero. So let, let, let's arrange the terms in pairs first. So um, we see this sum is positive, and this sum is negative, and this sum is positive, and this sum is negative, and so on. But all of these um, 
but the, the, these terms I put in circles are getting smaller and smaller in absolute value. So what we really have is an alternating series. We have something minus something smaller, plus something smaller still, minus something yet smaller. And from this, you can see that it converges, um, is so, so it's finite and non-zero. Um, and th th then there are the two other complex ones to look at. So let's just take a quick look at those and see what happens. So one of them would be 1 over 1 to the s plus i over 2 to the s minus i over 3 to the s minus 1 over um, 4 to the s and so on. And now um, we can see that this is non-zero at s equals 1, and that's fairly easy because we can just look at the, 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 the real part. So the real part is going to be 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 4 to the s plus 1 over 6 to the s minus 1 over 9 to the s and so on. And this is this is alternating with decreasing terms, so you can easily see that it's non-zero and finite at s equals 1. Um, the other one is just 1 over 1 to the s minus i over 2 to the s plus i over 3 to the s minus 1 over 4 to the s. And you notice immediately this is just the complex conjugate of this function here. So any, anything we say about this function, we can say something similar about that function. So there, there, there's, there's, um, it's quite common for these Dirichlet L series and characters to come in complex conjugate pairs. Um, now let's take a look at n equals 6. And here the numbers modulo um, 6 that are co-prime to 6 are just 1 and 5 with 5 squared congruent to 1. So there are only two possible characters, 1, 1 and 1 minus 1. Um, the first one gives us 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 5 to the s plus 1 over 7 to the s plus 1 over 11 to the s and so on. And what you notice is that this is just a product over all primes other than 2 and 3 of 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s, which is equal to 1 minus 2 to the minus s times 1 minus 3 to the minus s times the zeta of s. So you see um, it's again essentially the same as zeta of s, although now we've got two different primes we need to sort of take out of the infinite product for zeta of s. Um, the other one is 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 5 to the s plus 1 over 7 to the s minus 1 over 11 to the s. And this is more or less one of the functions we've had before. So you remember for p equals 3, we, we, we had this function um, 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 2 to the s um, plus 1 over 4 to the s minus 1 over 5 to the s and so on. And what you notice is that these two are really the same, except I've multiplied, to get from this one to this one, I, I have to multiply by 1 over 1 minus 2 to the minus s. So, um, so, um, it, so, so it really differs from the function we had for n equals 3 by, by just some sort of elementary Euler factor. So we, we haven't really... Um, um, got anything, sorry, that should be a plus sign. We haven't really got a new function. Both of the functions for um, n equals 6 are the same as functions we had for n equals 1 and n equals 3, except we, we, we have an el extra elementary Euler factor. So for 6, we get nothing new. And for 7, the numbers modulo 7 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And now we're going to repeat the argument we had for um, n equals 5, except we may as well do it for all primes p. So the key point is, if we look at the numbers 1, 2, up to p minus 1 mod p, um, we see that there is a primitive root g. So for 7, we can take a primitive root to be 3, 5, or 6. It doesn't really matter which. And we can think of these numbers as being g to the 0, g to the 1, g to the 2, up to g to the p minus 1, and g to the p equals 1. So chi of p is a piece root of, of unity, and there are p of these. So, um, so we get exactly p characters. So, so the characters are as follows. We, we have g to the 0, g to the 1, up to 
g to the p minus 1. And the, we could have a character that's 1 on them, or a character that's 1 and um, epsilon, and epsilon squared, and epsilon cubed, or it could be 1 epsilon squared, epsilon for 4, and so on. Here, epsilon is going to be e to the 2 pi i over p, so epsilon to p is equal to 1. 1 epsilon cubed, epsilon to the 6, and so on, all the way up to 1 epsilon to the p minus 1, epsilon to the 2p minus 2, and so on. So, so we have p characters for any prime p, and the first character gives us something rather boring. It's, it, as, as we saw with 2, 3, and 5, what it does is it gives us 1 minus um, p to the minus s times zeta of s as the L series. So um, we don't get anything new. The others all give us new L series, except these come in complex conjugate pairs, as we saw for, for p equals um, um, 5. There are various pairs, and maybe there's there might be one character in the middle that's that's actually real. Um, in fact, there yes, there's always one character that's real. Um, so um, so that does all primes. Um, now let's look at um, n equals eight. So here we have one, three, five, and seven as the elements of z modulo 8z star. And in all previous examples, we've been able to work out the characters just by picking a primitive root and saying that all elements are powers of that primitive root, and from that it was easy to find the characters. But we can't do that for n equals 8, because 8 doesn't have a primitive root. Um, so we have everything squared is equal to 1, and this means chi of 3 squared equals chi of 5 squared equals chi of 7 squared equals 1. So, so chi of, of n is always equal to plus or minus 1, unless n is even, in which case it's 0. And we also have chi of 7 is equal to 3 times 5 mod 8. So once we've chosen chi of 3 and 5, this determines chi of 7. So we see there are four possibilities. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, and 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. So let's take a look at these. Well, first of all, this one is the one we've already had. It's 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on, which is 1 minus 2 to the minus s times zeta of s. So that wasn't very interesting. This one we've actually also had before. It's just the 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 5 to the s, which we had modulo when we were working modulo 4. These two, however, are, 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 are new, so we get um, 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s minus 1 over 5 to the s minus 1 over 7 to the s plus 1 over 9 to the s, and so on. And this one we get 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 3 to the s minus 1 over 5 to the s plus 1 over 7 to the s, and so on. And um, um, we should think about these a little bit and work out whether or not they're zero. And if you think about it, um, it's quite easy to see they're both non-zero. For instance, this one has two positive terms, then two negative terms, then two positive terms, then two negative terms. But these two are bigger than these two. So the sum of these four is definitely positive, and the sum of these four is also definitely positive for the same reason, and so on. Um, these ones you have to think about a little bit more carefully. Um, and we can use the same argument we used for 5. So the sum of these two is positive, and the sum of these two is negative, but less in absolute value than that one. And the next two is the sum is positive, and the next two the sum is negative, but, le but that's less than that in absolute value, and that's less than that in absolute value. So, so what we have is an alternating series. If we take this term minus this term plus this term minus this term, and it's an alternating series of decreasing terms, so the sum is non-zero and finite. So we've checked that for n equals 8, all the Dirichlet series are non-zero and finite. Um, and now let's look at n equals 12. And 12, there are um, four numbers... 1, 5, 7, and 11, modulo 12. Um, and what I, I mean, we could do this like the case n equals 8, because you can see that 
all of these have square equal to 1. But what I want to do is to use a more general argument. So we're going to write n is equal to 3 times 4. And we notice that z over 12z star is can be written as z over 3z star times z over 2z. So it's z over 4z star. And now if you've got any homomorphism from this to the complex numbers, you can see it, it, it gives you a homomorphism from z modulo 3z to the complex numbers and a homomorphism from z modulo 4z to the complex numbers. And conversely, if you've got a homomorphism from each of these groups to the complex numbers, you get a homomorphism from this to the complex numbers. So we can now see directly how many Dirichlet characters there are. This is two characters. And we saw z modulo 4z also has two characters. So we can work out the characters of z modulo 12z. Um, we just get 2 times 2 characters. And we can do this whenever n um, can be has, is, is a product of different prime powers. Um, so um, um, if you want to write this out explicitly for n equals 12, we can see this. So n equals... Um, 12, we have 1, 5, 7, and 11. And the possible Dirichlet characters go 1, 1, 1, 1, or 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, or 1, um, 1, minus 1, minus 1, or 1, um, where's the other one? 1, minus 1, minus 1. Um, so um, what you notice is that this one is really character modulo 3, because it only depends on the value of this modulo 3, and that one's also a character modulo 3. Um, um, uh, this one um, is a character mod 4. Um, so, oops, sorry, that one. So, so we've got two characters mod 3, and two characters modulo 4, and all the characters mod 12 are obtained by multiplying one of these characters mod 3 by, by one of the characters modulo 4. So this one, for example, is given by taking the non-trivial character mod 3 and multiplying it by the non-trivial character modulo 4. Um, so we can now um, figure out how many Dirichlet characters there are mod n. So how many characters other mod n. So first of all, if n has a primitive root, then um, g, then the elements of z modulo n z star are just 1 g g squared up to g to the phi of n. And the Dirichlet characters are given by mapping g to epsilon to the um, uh, k, where epsilon is a primitive nth root of 1. So it's sign to the n is equal to 1. So we see that there are um, exactly phi of n characters. In particular, this works whenever n is a power of a, of a prime for p odd. And for p, um, for, for um, n a power of 2, we can do something similar because um, we know that z modulo nz star is then can be written as a product of two groups, the group plus or minus one times the powers of five. And now we can work out the, the Riechle characters modulo n in a rather similar way because there are two choices for the image of one. This can go to plus or minus one, and there are two to the two to the k minus two choices for the image of five. So again we get phi of n characters. Um, finally, if n is equal to p1 to the n1 times p2 to the n2 and so on, we apply the Chinese remainder theorem. So z modulo nz star is z modulo p1 um, to the n1 z star times and so on. And the characters of z modulo nz star can be written as a character of the first group times a character of the second group and so on by the Chinese remainder theorem. So the number of characters of z modulo nz star 
is equal to the number of characters of z modulo p1 z star, which as we said is phi of p1 to the n1 times phi of p2 to the n2 and so on. And Euler's phi function is just multiplicative, so this is phi of n. So the number of characters of z modulo nz star is equal to phi of n, which is equal to the order of z over nz star. So this is a very basic fact that we're going to use next lecture um, when discussing further properties of the characters. Um, so the next three lectures, um, the next lecture will be more properties of characters and L-series. The lecture after that will be how to deduce Dirichlet's theorem from non-vanishing of the of the Dirichlet L-series, and the final lecture will be on how you show Dirichlet L-series are non-zero.